Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon, and uh, thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you. Uh, my name is Hugh Thomas. I'm presently a uh, senior lecturer at Bits University, um, lecturing in mind surveying. And this afternoon's workshop will be just going through all those little things that I've picked up in my time as a mind surveyor that you're not necessarily confined in a, in a book. Uh, so there's little things that a mind survey will tell you here and, a, and another survey will tell you somewhere else. And uh, yeah, it's all those little experiences. Me personally, I'm, as you can hear, maybe hear from my accent, I'm originally from the UK. I um, grew up in uh, glorious Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds. I decided to uh, venture down to South Wales, where my father came from, to do some coal mine surveying. The then Traforest School of Mines or Polytechnic of Wales uh, did a two year course in mine surveying in coal. And then the coal mines decided to close down. And I decided to go and do my degree in Sheffield. So I headed north to Sheffield uh, during the miners' strike in the UK. So that was quite an eventful time in Sheffield. But during that time, I, uh, my third year, I was sent out to South Africa. Uh, for a year, a work experience, and I worked at Preston Holding, uh, Holdings Mine in Velcom. So I was there for the year, as I say, and headed back to Sheffield, got my degree, and then decided I needed to get a job. And I was actually sitting on a train station in France in a little town called Auxerre. And whilst I was sitting at the station waiting for my train, uh, Johnny Clegg came on the radio, uh, or the, the music was playing in the train station. And I immediately knew that I was going to go back to South Africa. So beginning of 1988, I returned. And in my interview, I said I wanted to go to Velcom and they couldn't get me to sign quick enough. Um, so I was back to Velcom, working for Anglo again. And then I was president of Stain Mine. Spent four years at Stain and then managed to get a very nice job at Joaneng Diamond Mine in Botswana for two years. And whilst I was there, I just signed a new contract and I was offered a job at uh, Anglo-American's head office in Johannesburg. So all in all, I spent uh, 27 years with Anglo. And then towards the end of that career, I decided time to give something back. So here we go. A little bit of a uh, bit of my experience in these next lot of lectures as well. Okay, so first of all, we talk about map projections when it comes to surveying. So what is a map projection? So what we're trying to do is represent a 3D surface onto a 2D surface, i.e. or a map. Okay, today, yes, we do have our fancy softwares where we can maintain that 3D uh, visualization, but more often than not, we, we use a plan. We got a 2D surface. So why map projection? Well, the first requirement is to define that coordinate system of which there are many. And that specifies the shape and the origin of that coordinate system. There are developed or manipulated surfaces. So maps and plans are, are projections of the surface onto the flat without distorting a relationships. However, a spherical surface cannot be flattened without distortion. And we will have a look at some of those distortions as we go through the presentation this afternoon. And distortions in mapping have several implications. Okay. So the map projection that we're using in South Africa at the moment, and sorry for those people that may be joining us from outside of South Africa, this will be predominantly uh, RSA orientated. Okay, so the map projection that we're using at the moment is a hard to be of 94 datum. Uh, and that's a system which is known as a transverse Mercator projection or Gauss conform. And that name Gauss will come up at the end of the presentation as well. So just remember that person's name. Okay, and the Gauss conform that is tangential to the geoid and conformal, then in all distances and angles are true. So if you look at the diagram there, we've got a little bit of a like table tennis ball stuff in the toilet roll holder. So you can see where that, uh, the for want of a better analogy, the toilet roll actually touches the table tennis ball. And you can see that on this instance on a meridian. Okay. So the distortion factors in mapping, we will discuss uh, this as well as we go through is the scale factor. Uh, we have obviously true north and grid north. 
and we have meridian convergence. So with meridian convergence, I'm going to show you a nice big long calculation, but don't worry, I'm, you're not going to be tested on it. It's just purely to show you where meridian convergence is used in uh, survey and especially for mapping and uh, uh, coordinate net, uh, systems. Okay, so the South African standard for mapping, as I mentioned, is the Hartebius 94 data. And that came into existence or in South African survey existence on the 1st of January, 1999, and is based on the WGS 84 GI. Prior to that, we were on the Clark 1880 modified uh, Cape geoid, uh, that is the Cape datum. And this was used on all mines developed before this date, not just mines, well, basically everywhere, but being, being a mine survey, I'm a little bit more prone to mentioning the mines itself, okay. And that coordinate system may still be used today. You can imagine now a mine that started maybe in the 40s or 50s. Uh, you can imagine the amount of maps and plans that have been generated in that time. And now you've got to convert that to uh, WG. So you can get an exemption, um, but you will, and we will look at transformations later on. You will have to have a transformation uh, so that you can convert between the old uh, Cape datum and the new Hartebius 94 datum. But we'll go into that in more detail a bit later on. So care therefore has to be taken when dealing with adjacent mines, if their start dates span this period. So I could be on a mine that started before 19, uh, 1st of January 1999, and then a mine next door starts up after the 1st of January 1999. So we could be on two different systems, one on the Cape and the other one on the Heart of Beerstock. So it's a very uh, important that you actually know that uh, from a mine surveying point of view, because you could be uh, heading for trouble otherwise. Okay, so we have our geodetic, uh, geodetic our spherical, uh, coordinates, or want, for want of better, you know, everybody knows is latitude and longitudes. Uh, then we have our Cartesian coordinates, which are grid or plane rectangular coordinates. So in South Africa, we have our, we don't have X, Y, we have Y, X, and Z coordinates. Uh, and if you look at the two bullets at the bottom there, we have our LO system, as we mentioned before, the Gauss conformal uh, Cape datum, and the LO uh, system, uh, WGS 84, the Arctic burst of 94 datum. So they're the, both called LO, um, and basically looking at the longitudinal uh, lines of, but we'll look at the meridians as we go get into the presentation. And there in the middle, also we have a, another system. Uh, and if you're in the, the Johannesburg area, you will should know about the Vitz Goldfield system. So even though we do have our national control survey systems, or NCSS, which is our our LO systems, which you see at the bottom, there are other systems around, okay. Okay, so we mentioned our latitudes and longitudes. There's a nice little diagram there from the Chief Director of Surveys of Mapping. So for the Earth, the basic coordinate system is uh, the geodetic or geographic system, latitude and longitudes. So you can see them there in that diagram. So the latitude is defined as the angle phi measured from north or south from the equatorial plane. And longitude is the angle measured on the in the plane of the equator between Greenwich Meridian and any other meridian. So this angle lambda is measured positive towards the east or negative to the west. Okay, so just defining this, the a three D surface. Uh, so we have a geoid, which is the shape of an assumed Earth using a theoretical water surface, as it would be without terrain and without external gravity. So all heights are referenced to the geoid. And then we have the ellipsoid, which is a mathematical representation of the shape of the Earth, which smooths the geoid. So all coordinates are referenced to a defined, defined ellipsoid. Now, when you do leveling, uh, we normally call those heights orthometric heights. And the height that you will get from a GNSS system or GPS system will give you ellipsoidal heights. And those two heights are very different. So you have geoidal separation. So with GPS or GNSS, it is very important that when you do your uh, transformation uh, with your GPS system, that you go on to known points of elevation or orthometric heights, which are related to uh, mean sea level. And we'll discuss that a little bit later on. Is if you use the ellipsoidal heights that are derived from the GPS, there will be a separation. They will not be correct. 
So you have to bring them back down to earth for want of a better analogy. Okay, so let's carry on. So the datum will define the origin of a coordinate system in terms of latitude, angle north or south of the equator, and the longitude, angle east or west of Greenwich, and the height, the vertical distance above or below the geoid. Okay, so back in 1880, a British geodesist named Clark calculated the followed following dimensions for the Earth. So you have a semi-major axis A and a semi-minor axis B. So you can see that the, uh, the, the axes do change in uh, dimension. And the difference between the two axes is roughly 20 kilometers, give or take. Okay, so these dimensions were accepted when the South African ellipsoid of reference was chosen for the Cape datum. However, since then better results were obtained using satellite technology. We obviously do a lot more fancy surveys and you can imagine now this, Clark surveyed all the way down from uh, the UK, all the way down through Africa to South Africa. Okay, so the Earth is not a sphere. So if this comes up in a pub quiz, or if you're on tipping point or something, and someone asks you a question, the Earth is not a sphere, in, in fact, an oblate spheroid. So that means that the uh, circumference around the equator is greater than the circumference around the poles. Now I've just done a nice little diagram in microstation and plonked it on there. You can actually look at the dimensions. So it is slightly squashed. Someone's actually sat on the earth and squashed it slightly. Okay, so on the left-hand side in the table, uh, table there for the WGS84 system, you have your um, major axes, uh, and then you have a flattening, which is, which is uh, calculated uh, from the semi-major axis B, and then well, that little fancy calculation there. Okay, and then, if we look at uh, the accuracy of, of Clark's survey, uh, when we compare it to uh, the WG, uh, Clark accuracy was in 200, with, within 250 meters. So you can imagine surveying all the way down through Africa and you're only 250 meters out, which um, isn't too bad. Okay, so with our South African LO system, all our plans, maps and plans will have an LO uh, name to it, and they will always be the odd numbers. So in this, if you look at the meridians going across here, uh, the, the ones in red, you'll have all the odd numbers, 27, 29, 31, 33. So if someone gives you a plan and they say it's LO 32, you know they're actually talking a load of nonsense because it doesn't exist. The survey system for South Africa, we use the odd numbers. And you will see that these are two degree bandwidths. So anything, uh, say from 31 across to 30, and then across to 32, that will be one sort of like, you can call it mapping area. And there will be a little bit of overlap that goes into 29. So you may have a trig beacon that is LO31 and has an LO29 coordinate, okay? Because it's actually sitting in this overlap area of uh, say LO30. Okay, and then obviously likewise on the other side. So you just got to be careful when you pick up your maps and plans or you get a coordinate list that you take that LO number and get the coordinates accordingly. So the government trig, you have files and files and files of uh, trig beacon coordinates. Make sure that you're getting the correct um, LO meridian. Okay, to work from. Okay, so here's the gratitude of the Gauss conformal system. So on the left hand side here, you'll see how in this instance we're using LO27, and then it goes out to 26 uh, to the west, and then 20 out, 28 out to the east. Okay, and here's our lines of latitude coming down. Okay, so the South African system. We will have a positive Y coordinate, which heads off out to the west, and negative Y coordinates to the east. So it's very important that you do not forget the signs, because if you don't, if you don't, if you forget the signs, then you could actually have like a calzone pizza. Everything sits on the one side, and this did actually happen many years ago. We did a mapping project. And there was a new survey, uh, aerial survey company uh, did some work for us when I was at Anglo. And it so happened that the mine that we were doing the mapping on 
was bang smack on the central meridian. So when they sent us the coordinates for all the mapping points uh, and everything like that, all we had was positive coordinates because this software didn't understand the negative coordinate. So anything that was a negative, it gave it a positive. So it was amazing that we had mapping all on the, on the western side of the meridian, nothing on the eastern side. And it was purely because it didn't recognize that negative coordinate. So just be careful there with the negative. In South Africa, because we're well below the, the equator, our X coordinates are always positive, okay? And zero increases south uh, in the LO system, okay? And then on the right-hand side there, you can see where the equator is sitting there, at zero south. So all our coordinates, as I mentioned, are positive X, but we do have positive Y and negative Ys, okay? So we just need to be careful of those. And we'll look at an ex uh, example um, where you have to, well, you always have to take consideration of the signs of your coordinates, especially the Ys. Okay, so just to recap, uh, the yellow 29 Cape datum so this is prior to the 1st of January, uh, 1999. So the datum is Cape, the ellipsoid is Cape, uh, Clark 1880 modified. Our projection is RSA LO system transverse Mercator south oriented, so zero is south. Uh, our central meridian could be any of those odd numbers, but we just put here as a 29 east. Uh, false, false easting is plus minus uh, zero, false northering is plus minus zero. And on the meridian, we have a scale factor of one, but we will be looking at scale factors as we go through the presentation. So this is from uh, SERPAC, which was a program initially set up by Keith Young. Um, he's now retired and somebody else has taken over this program, but basically a fantastic piece of survey software. And if you put in your survey system, you will put in the fact that your so it is Clark 1880, you'll put in the LO system 29. So this obviously you can drop this down and put any of those odd number um, meridians that you, wherever you're working. And your projection here shows you this RSA LO system Cape datum. Okay, and blanked out there, but the hemisphere, we are in the south. And then you can see all your constants here. Then looking at the WG29. So now that, you know, we don't want to write hard to be a stock 94 all the time. So it's either LO29, which is the Cape datum, or WG29, which is the hard to be a stock 94 data. So rather than write all these different things out, we just when I was at Angler, we just said it was either LO29 or WG29. Okay, so for the Hardebius Look 94 datum, the datum is Hardebius Look 94. The ellipsoid, ellipsoid is WGS 1984. The projection still RSA. It's a WGS uh, system, uh, transverse Mercator. It's still south oriented. And once again, just taking a, a, an odd number, uh, 29 east, and the false eastings and northings and the scale factor are the same. And as we say, this was post uh, 1st of January, 1999. And there's the SERPAC um, layout of the survey system when you, you set up that coordinate uh, or the survey system for the coordinates. Okay. All right. So I mentioned the signs, don't forget the signs. So be careful when using South African projection in a Northern hemisphere system. When I, when I talk about Northern hemisphere, I'm talking about software that has been developed uh, north of the equator, uh, especially something like uh, Bentley Microstation. We'll have a look at a little bit of an example now, now. So what happens is what is positive becomes negative and vice versa, except the elevation. So we've got an example here, coordinate in WGS uh, system. Uh, y is a negative, okay? So we're on the Eastern side of the meridian. Our X is a positive, south of the equator, and our Z was sitting at 717.908 meters. That does not change, okay? The Z elevation does not change. So if I'm going to plot a South African coordinate into say my, my, uh, Bentley Microstation, there's my coordinate. I've just copied from the previous slide. When I type in to plot a point, I would actually have to type in X, Y, I remove the negative from the Y, but I add a negative to the X because we're on a South African LO system, zero south. Okay, whereas a 
system that's set up or manufactured or developed in the northern hemisphere, they will have a, a typical mathematical grid rather than our south uh, zero pointing grid. Okay, and as I mentioned, the elevation does not change. So we do not change that, that stays the same. So if I plot that point, and then I tentative to it, and I pick that point up, so you see I've put my cursor there and I picked it up, there's my coordinates still. My Y is a negative and my X is a positive. But when I then look at that point, the coordinates which I've plotted, it's telling me, yes, it is a positive Y and a negative X. So now if I've got multiple points in a Bentley MicroStation, and I want to export all of those points into a uh, coordinate file. Uh, thankfully, I've got a, a program called JDOR, which was uh, developed by a colleague of mine at uh, Anglo at the time, uh, Jose Rodriguez. Um, and he wrote programs that you could actually export all those points, put it into a coordinate file, and it would then put it back into the South African uh, format. Okay, with negative Y in this instance and a positive X. So there are softwares that you can use to download and uh, change them. So basically the, uh, the multiplier is minus one. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about with map projections is scale factor. Okay. So here you can see in this diagram, we have our central meridian. Uh, we have to take into consideration how far we are away from that central meridian. Or, uh, scale factor and how far above sea level we are to calculate a scale factor. Okay, so any measurement that you make on surface, say with a total station, measure a distance, we have to apply a scale factor to make it an LO distance. So we've got a, a raw real distance which we measure with a total station. We then have to apply a scale factor so that we can actually plot it on our maps or plans in that LO system. And that is in accordance to how far we are away from the central meridian and how far we are above mean sea level. Okay, so here's a nice little uh, calculation for you, not too difficult. Okay, so scale enlargement and mean sea level correction factor. And this is for the LO system, which is we have our two degree bandwidth. So our scale enlargement. So here we have our horizontal, horizontal distance, which we measure with our total station. We need to multiply that by a factor that then allows us to plot that on an LO map or plan. There's one of the distortions that we're talking about, okay. So in this instance, we will take an area which we're working in and we'll take the mean Y coordinate of that area. We substitute that into the uh, formula here. So it'll be Y squared divided by two R squared, where R, is 6373000 is, 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 a, is a constant, okay. So that's the radius of the earth. And the answer to this is always positive, okay. Then we have to take into consideration sea level correction. So up here in Johannesburg with 1600 plus whatever meters, we need to take into consideration that in comparison to where we would have been at sea level. So in this instance, it's the horizontal distance, which we measured, multiplied by our R, our constant, divided by R plus the mean elevation of where we're working. Okay, so say here in, in Joburg, say 1600 meters or whatever. Okay, so here's a little bit of an example. So I've got two beacons, uh, beacon A and beacon B. Uh, there's the coordinates, there's the elevations. Okay, so my mean, calculate the mean y coordinate. So basically, it's the two uh, y coordinates, add them together, divide by two, gives me a mean LO coordinate for that area that I'm working in. And then I calculate the mean z, basically the two elevations, add them together, divide by two, gives me my mean z. So then I'm now going to substitute those into the uh, formula. So when I calculate my scale enlargement, I get a nice small number, a 0.00. .00 116926. And then when I do the sea level correction, I get a 0 0.99981034. So now I've got the two factors that I'm looking for. So what I all I need to do now is combine them and I add them together. And that then gives me a scale factor correction, a 
0.9999273 for that particular area, okay? So therefore, if I get my total station out and I'm in the field and I measure a distance and it's bang smack on one kilometer or a thousand meters, if I'm going to now do a uh, calculation of a, uh, a peg that's a thousand meters away, okay, in this particular area, I need to multiply it by this factor. And then the elo distance, which I'm then going to plot on my map or plan, will actually be 999 meters, 0.927, okay. And that will then be the elo distance. I've applied the scale factor. Okay, so we multiply the measured distance by the scale factor correction, and that will give you the corrected distance calculating a coordinate in the LO system. Okay. There is another way of calculating uh, the factor, and it's basically exactly the same as what I've done. Here we're putting one plus one plus one minus one minus, you end up with basically the same number. Okay, so what I've done here is I've put this into SERPAC. Um, so if I'm working in uh, an LO system, I put my coordinate in, uh, which is one of the, the mean, which I've calculated earlier um, with the mean height. It automatically will give me the scale factor, sea level and scale factor, uh, scale enlargement factor, okay, which is exactly what we calculated, okay. So if I've got that there now and I'm calculating a peg, which is 100 meters away, Okay, and, I'm, and it's a vertical angle of 90, so it's a horizontal distance. It will then give me a coordinate accordingly in LO. And it will tell, then tell me that the horizontal distance, you remember the measured distance, it was at 90, that was the horizontal distance, which I measured for the total station. The LO, which we will then plot in this software, will be 99.993 meters. Okay, so I'm applying that scale factor. So now if I do a calculation from that point to that beacon, there is my horizontal distance. So the proof is actually in the joint. We'll look at joints in a minute as well, how, uh, in a minute, how to calculate them. Okay, so that will then be my LO distance between the two. These pegs are plotted in LO, all right. Okay, so what happens when we actually want to set something out in the field and we've taken coordinates off of an LO plan? Okay, therefore, to set out a point that has been calculated from an LO system join, we apply, excuse me, the, apply the reciprocal of the calculated scale factor. So there was our scale factor, which we calculated. If we take the reciprocal of it, it will give us 1.00072775. Okay, so remember, we had a distance of 99.993, that was a join distance. So now I'm multiplying that by the reciprocal of that LO scale factor, and it will give me an answer of 100 meters. So when I go back out into the field, and I need to set out that, those two points, which I've seen on my map and plan, in the field, I actually have to set out the true distance, which I would have originally surveyed or measured with a total station. Okay, so we're just going backwards. So from the field to the plan, we apply the factor, the straightforward scale factor. When we go in the opposite direction, we apply the reciprocal of that scale factor. Okay, so to recap, the distance that is measured with the total station has to be corrected so that it can be plotted on a map or plan in the LO system. To do this, we calculate the scale factor and apply the correction. This will be the LO distance. So therefore to set out a point using a total station, we take that LO distance taken from the coordinate join or distance from a map and plan and apply the reciprocal of the scale factor for the distance to be set out, okay? So it's very important that you, you don't just take the join and then set out, because uh, this in this instance, yes, it was only seven millimeters, but if you're doing lots of survey and lots of setting out, you can eventually have a, a bad plan or bad set outs, okay? So when you, if you want to come and do something, things just do not fit, all right. So carrying on the distance that is measured with the total station has to be corrected. So yes, we did uh, apply scale factor, but we must also take into consideration ambient temperature, T, and the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, P. So you don't just pick up a total station, plunk it on top of a, 
a tripod and off you go. You have to apply temperature and pressure, especially if you're doing high order accurate surveys where you are looking for millimeters. Okay, uh, this is because the EDM or electronic distance measurement uh, measuring system is affected by temperature and pressure. And this correction is set in the instrument, which gives a PPM value or part per million value to be applied to all measurements. So temperature and pressure must be measured regularly as the temperature pressure changes throughout the course of the day. So my, my pressure might not change too much unless we have storms, uh, but the temperature obviously early morning through to midday, mid afternoon, and then through to evening. If you're a conscientious surveyor and you're out all day, uh, then you're gonna have to be changing your uh, PPM settings by just plugging in the temperature and the pressure. Okay, obviously as a, as a, a good surveyor, you should work early in the morning and, and late in the afternoon, because that's when the temperature is uh, best and you do not get too much shimmer when you're working. At the height of the day, yes, you will get a lot of shimmer and your surveys will not, will suffer accordingly. Okay, so just to remember, a projection is a system, systematic way of representing all or part of a round body, i.e. the earth on a plane. So some distortion is unavoidable. Okay, so we've mentioned joins and we've mentioned polars. So this is a quick little, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have done this already. You know what a join and a polar is, but just in case you haven't, uh, the distance and direction are calculated from two coordinates. So that's basically what a join is. Okay, so we've got two points, A and B, and we want to know what is the relationship between those two, i.e. what is the distance between the two and what is the direction between those two points. Okay, a polar is basically I've got one point and I need to know what the coordinates of the other point is. And I've got a distance and I've got a direction. So then I can calculate that second point. All right, for the South African system, I've drawn this little quadrant here, so you will get a copy of this, I'm sure, on, and, and then the recording as well. Okay, so zero is south. Um, that's our South African system. And we go clockwise. So to the west is 90, north is 180, east is 270, and then we come all the way back around to zero or 360 at the bottom here. Okay, so for calculating joins, we split our 360 into four quadrants. So the first 90, if we calculate our differences in Ys, and we'll look at that in a second, and the differences in Xs, and they're both positive, then it sits in quadrant one. And in that instance, we do not do anything to uh, the direction that we get from that calculation. We plus minus zero to it, nothing happens. If, when we do the calculation, we get a positive Y and a negative X, it's then sitting in quadrant number two. So it sits between 90 and 180. And in this instance, whatever the answer is, we add 180 to that answer. Likewise, if we get a negative Y and a negative X, that sits in quadrant three, and we add 180 to that particular answer. And then if we're in quadrant four, when we do our calculation, we get a negative Y and a positive X, then we add 360. So let's have a look as we go through. Okay, so to calculate a joint, so if I'm going from P1 to P2, it is then the Y of two minus the Y of one. Okay, so it would be uh, P2 Y coordinates minus P Y of one coordinates. Okay, and then that is divided in by similarly, the x coordinates. Okay, so it's x2 minus x1. Okay, so whatever that comes out as, that's where we have that positive y or negative y over a positive or a negative x. And that's where that quadrant comes in. Okay, all right. So we take arc tan of that, and that will give us an answer. The distance between the two is the difference in the y's, difference in x, square root, or uh, both squared, square root, straightforward Pythagoras, nothing difficult there. Okay, so let's have a look at quadrant one. So I'm going from A to B, so it's B minus A, okay? Remember, there it's, if it's P1 to P2, it's two minus one. So that's exactly what I've done there. So A to B is gonna be B minus A. So my distance, straightforward Pythagoras, you get a distance of 42.426. Here, direction A to B, 
you see they're both positive. Okay, so whatever the answer comes out as, I do nothing to that answer, and it's 45 degrees. So if that's zero there, and that's 90, I've done this in such a way that that is at 45 degrees, and A to B telling me so. Then I go to the second quadrant. So C to D, in this instance, my X is a negative. So the distance is still the same, it hasn't changed. Okay, but now I'm getting arctan of minus one, which gives me minus 45 degrees. So therefore, it's in quadrant two, so I add 180. So I add 180 to the 45, it gives me 135. And that is 90, that is 180, that's halfway between the two. So yes, proof is in, the, in what I can see there, that will be 135. So third quadrant, same story, E to F, which is F minus E, distance is gonna stay the same. These are then both negative, okay? And it will give me an answer of 45 degrees. But then I add 180, because I'm in the third quadrant, so it's 225. So there's 180, there's 270, midway, it's 225, there's my proof. And then finally, the last quadrant, uh, where I have a negative Y and a positive X, once again, gives me a minus 45, but because I'm in the fourth quadrant, I add 360 to that, and it gives me 315. There's 270, there's 360, midway, 315. Proof is in the, in the pudding there. Okay, all right. So that is basically how we do our joins in the South African system. So just remember the quadrant and then whatever the answers come through. So it's quite a simple system. So let's do a fancy coordinate, uh, which we may have uh, taken off a map or plan. We're gonna hit just an example of the second quadrant. So A to B is B minus A. So my distance there is 647 meters bang smack on by uh, using Pythagoras again. Here, I've got a positive Y and a negative X. Okay, so I'm then in the quadrant two. So whatever my answer comes out there, I add my 180 and the answer is 1112808. Simple as that. So if you're going to do any joins, that's the way to do it, okay. So now we talk about a polar. So we've given one point and we've got the distance and direction to the other unknown coordinates. And then we can calculate the coordinates of that unknown point P2. Okay, so a lot of little uh, scenarios here, but basically if I'm calculating my difference in Y, it's uh, the direction one, to, uh, the distance one to two, multiplied by the sign of the direction one to two. And then for to calculate my X coordinate or the X difference to calculate the X coordinate, it's one to two, okay, multiplied by the cos of that direction. So it's the distance one to two multiplied by the cos. So uh, when I teach my students, I say it's Y sign. Y sign the checkbook, Y sign your life away. Because um, it's always Y sign. And then it's always X cos. Okay, all right. A simple way of remembering. So in this instance, I've got my coordinate G, I've got a direction, and I've got a distance. So I take my coordinate of G, and I add the distance multiplied by the sine of the direction for the Ys. And in this instance, for the X, it's the cos of the direction uh, multiplied by the distance. You just add that through, and you'll get the coordinates of your point H in this instance. So a pretty straightforward calculation, nothing too difficult. Just remember Y sine X cos. Okay, so there are special cases. There's always a special case. There's always a special child somewhere. Okay, so what happens when X is equal to zero? Okay, when we've calculated these things out. So here you see some fancy diagrams of what happens when something becomes zero. All right, so if the Y is zero, then the tan of difference in y or difference in x is, is zero. Tan, um, uh, arc tan of, of zero is either 180, zero or 360. So what happens is therefore, if x is zero, then both points lie on the same degree of latitude. Okay, so we look at the y coordinates to see which point is more east or west. So then if we've got a and b both sitting on the same uh, line of latitude, you see which one is bigger than the other. And then we can work out which direction, whether it's going 90 
or 270, whether we're going east or we're going west. Okay, so similarly, if y is zero, both points lie on the same degree of longitude. Okay, and the direction then is either north or south. So then you've got to look at the coordinates of that point to see which is the greater. So you can work out what the direction is between those two points. Okay, so another one of our little distortions is known as meridian convergence. So here's a fancy little diagram. Um, just memorize this at the bottom here because I will be asking questions a little bit later. Okay, and if you could see my face, I'd be smiling, but I'm only joking. All right, don't worry about that one. This one's a far more easier calculation for meridian conversion. Uh, convergence, sorry. So we have a difference in longitude, seconds, and that's multiplied by the sign of latitude. So basically, rather than that fancy one we just saw, is difference in longitude multiplied by the sign of the latitude. Okay, so this is a practical example that I did many, many years ago in the early days of uh, uh, GNSS or GPS, where we were quite confident with it, but we weren't 100%. Uh, so we liked to do some fancy survey work. And as I always say to my students, there's always one, well, especially in this country, uh, especially today, there is one beacon that's always around. Uh, when I did this particular exercise at college in Sheffield, that beacon wasn't very, very obvious many, many days of the year. And what is that beacon? It's the sun. So when you're in the in South, South Yorkshire, you don't see that sun very often. Whereas here, yes, that beacon's always lingering around somewhere. So it's a very handy beacon to have. All right, so as I mentioned, GPS, we weren't that, we were happy with it, but we were a little bit, um, not too sure about it. And when we go through this example, you'll understand why we, we did a sun azimuth. I see I do have quite a few chats here, um, but I'll get to those a little bit later if you don't mind, if there's any questions, if it's be okay. All right, so I was at a point GS266, and you'll be able to see where this is in a little bit later. So we were at a latitude here and the longitude. So this we've just picked up with a normal handheld GPS system. Okay, nothing too fancy. Uh, we knew where we were. We were on the central meridian. We were in this in instance, we were using a UTM uh, mapping system, universal transverse Mercator. And this system has a six degree bandwidth, whereas in the LO system, we have two degree. This, this one is a six degree. So you can imagine that there will be quite a little bit more distortion uh, using uh, mapping UTM. So a central meridian in this instance was 39. So if we look at this little formula here, difference in longitude, we calculate that thing out there. We've got our information here and we have a meridian convergence once you calculate that through of 26 minutes and 19.2 seconds. So that's a number that we're gonna see a little bit later, okay. Okay, so this is where we were. I was actually in Eritrea, um, bang smack over here with that little blue dot. So that's where that coordinate is taken. So we, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Mr. Rami Ramsawa, uh, myself have traveled all the way to Eritrea, we built this beacon. And now we were wanting to uh, put out some survey, uh, some pre-marks for some aerial survey in this area. Unfortunately, there was no survey control in this area at all. The only beacon that we knew of or had a, a GPS system was back in Asmara here where the airplane is. So to travel all the way back was just not on. So what we did is we set up the GPS on our beacon. We set up another GPS or base, we base on the beacon and rover on another one. And we set that up and I think we left it running for about 12 hours. And that gave us a direction between those two points. We then did a sun azimuth between those two points, um, just to check to see if the, the GPS was given us a good answer. Okay. Invariably on this little tour here, when we did this trip back in 98, uh, you'll see this boundary here, this is Ethiopia. And while we were there, war broke out. So we had to hightail it uh, from Olgaro all the way back to Asmara and then get out of the country pretty quick, pretty quickly. So it was one of those uh, surveying stories you'd tell over a beer. Uh, so maybe one day when we all get together, 
I'll be able to tell you that story when we were overtaking tanks on the way back to camp. All right, so there's our camp, middle of nowhere. There was our beacon. That was our beacon, there was the camp there. So it was our beacon where we set up. So when we go through that calculation, so I knew I know exactly where I was. If, so, if I was in court and someone said, where were you on the 13th of May, 1998, 1980, uh, 1998, at half past two in the afternoon, I would exactly know exactly where I was. Okay, so yes, always good to keep records. So there was my latitude, longitude, which I've mentioned. Um, calculate our R's, our declination and E. Uh, we were in the Northern Hemisphere, so we got N as our, as our formula. So then we had the Star Almanac for land surveyors. So this is, you can see the book 1998. This is the page I was looking at. So Wednesday, the 13th of May, 1998. So that was the information that I'm going to use to calculate the sun azimuth. All right, so I'm not going to test on this, don't worry about it. There's all my calculation. And eventually I get to the, my last page of, of uh, calculations here. And there's my meridian convergence. That's where that's coming in. So when I calculated everything out, we had a bearing, the GS, uh, GS 266 to 267, which was another pre-marker that we built and we put a, uh, our rover there. We were citing to that with the total station. We got a bearing from the sun azimuth of 820607.4 seconds. And our GPS bearing, which we, as I said, we set up the two GPS systems. Uh, we left it running for about 12 hours plus, and we got a bearing of 820606. So we were only 1.4 seconds out between the sun azimuth, sighting the sun, and using the GPS. So we were quite happy that our survey was orientated correctly. So now why are we talking about the meridian convergence? Well, many years ago, when I was still working with Anglo, we did a lot of work in the copper belt and one of the mines of Concola, uh, I did a large uh, aerial survey there with all the uh, trig beacons in the area. And when we compared that survey with the, with the survey on the actual mine, there was a difference between the two orientation between beacons. And when we calculated meridian convergence, we realized that that was the difference. So many years ago, when the guys had set up the survey system on that mine, they hadn't taken into consideration meridian convergence. Whereas the GPS going onto the trig beacons in that area in Zambia had the meridian convergence uh, built into it. Okay, so immediately we knew that there was a difference between the two survey systems and it was basically the meridian convergence was the issue. But you can see here, sighting the sun and using GPS, very, very accurate. So it proved that the GPS was good enough. So what do we need to do with sun azimuth? You don't just sight the sun with your total station. You have to put a, a filter on the front. So this, this actually then fits on the telescope of your total station. You look through the eyepiece at the other end, and you'll see here this uh, in quadrant four quadrants here, or quadrants, I should say, and it splits your image into four, which you can see here. So when you're sighting the sun, you will get the sun perfectly in the middle. You'll track it, which is quite difficult. And then you'll say, go, stop. And you leave the instrument where it is. And that's where all this comes in your date, your time, you, you've got a, your uh, GPS, you've got a time from that, you know your latitude and longitude, and this is what you record. You do not move your instrument again until you've taken all those readings. So it's like a, a moment in time, okay? So basically that's how you do your sun azimuths, uh, sighting the sun, and it's a fantastic beacon as long as there's no cloud cover. This thing here, the eyepiece or the, uh, the actual prism itself, this does flip back and forth. So always remember to flip it back before you look through the telescope, or else you just might put a hole in the back of your head uh, when you sight the sun. Okay, so it's just one of those little things you, you've got to <laughs> be cognizant of. All right. Okay, so in this particular uh, project that we were on, we were using UTM. So we mentioned scale factor before when we had the Y squared over two R squared, et cetera, et cetera. 
when we're using UTM, we use a different method of calculating scale enlargement and mean sea level. Um, so here you have, there's the formula basically, and you combine the two. And in this instance, you multiply them. Okay, and that will give you a scale factor. All right, so in this instance here, uh, we were easting of 320, R is three, uh, 6378, as we had before. Uh, no, it's actually different, we had 6373 before. Uh, the height above mean sea level, we were 841. So if we calculate that out, we get a scale factor almost equal to one. So in this instance, there we have it again. So if I measured a kilometer in the field, if I'm going, then going to plot it on the plan, it would be 999 meters, 0.866. Okay, all right. So a slightly different calculation for scale factor between the LO system, which is two degree bandwidth, and the UTM system, which is six degree bandwidth. Okay, all right. So we talked about elevations earlier. We talked about ellipsoidal heights and orthometric heights. Um, the ellipsoidal heights being generated from BPS, orthometric being those elevations that we level, okay? <clears throat> so by definition, and this is from a book, Land Surveying, uh, by Ramsey J.P. Wilson. I don't think it's in print anymore. I've got a copy in my office. It's the book that I first had when I first trundled off down to South Wales to do mine surveying. So I still value it very much. So the definition, the definition of leveling is the process of measuring the difference in height between points on the surface of the earth. So the purpose of leveling is to determine the difference in height elevation between two or more points. So just the thing to remember, MSL is MSL or above mean sea level, okay? So that's usually what we relate our elevations to. We have a benchmark, a stable reference point for leveling and survey. So every mine in South Africa will have a benchmark we'll have, and we'll have an X, Y, Z coordinate. And that is what the mine is based on. Okay, so that benchmark coordinate could either be in the old CAPE data or the new WG. Invariably, it will now be in the WG. It's easy to go and survey it. But don't forget, the plans could be in the old system. We've got HPC, which is height plane of collimation, uh, which we won't go into that in any great detail. But if you are doing survey work, that is uh, an important line. Basically, it's the when you set up your level on a tripod and it's all nicely leveled, and horizontal, the line that it is throwing out horizontally is the height of plane of collimation. And we do a two peg test. So every morning before you start leveling, you do your two peg test and that checks the collimation error. Okay, so if there is an error, the way around it is to always set up between your two points that you're leveling, where the two staffs are put. Okay, if you go, if your instrument is out of error, and you go closer to one and further away from the other, obviously, then you will be introducing error. All right, so the elevation height information obtained is normally referred to a datum line. So the datum most commonly used is mean sea level because it allows for international comparability of elevations and heights. So other, ar other arbitrary lines above or below sea level may also be used, for example, in mining. Okay, in days gone by when I first got to um, Welcome, we had a false elevation. So they meant that everything had a positive or everything had a negative uh, elevation. So there was no issues when you went through uh, sea level, okay. So on your map or plan, uh, you'll have here, you can see the central meridian 27 east, um, but then it says heights are to the nearest meter above mean sea level. So that's I've just enlarged up there, okay. So mean sea level for South Africa determined at Cape Town, Durban, Port Elizabeth, and East London. So carrying on, so when we do some uh, leveling work, we've got to make sure that we either start and close on known points or we go in a, a, a circuit that we always end up on a known point so that we can see if we have a misclosure error, okay? So the first one here is closed run. So we start on a blue point, which is a known elevation. We go through the red, red, red. We don't know those elevations. We're gonna calculate those. And we end up on a peg, which we know the elevation of. We've leveled it before. So that's a closed run because we're closing it. This is a closed double run because we're going out 
on unknown points. We get to the end and it's always best to come back through those points. So then you're getting mean height elevation differences between the two, which you can take the mean of, and you end up back on that known point. So if you have this closure error, you can adjust that leveling accordingly. Then on this closed circuit, so we're starting on a known point, uh, we're going out, so tip, just go whack one, close double run. If we were going, say, in a haulage uh, underground or we we're doing some leveling, typically that's what we do. We wouldn't be able to come around because we haven't hauled anywhere yet. In this instance, maybe on surface, we've got a massive great big uh, tailings dam here. What we do is we start here, we go all the way around, and we come back where we started from, and we can calculate our misclosure error accordingly. Okay, so what is a misclosure error? All right. So typically for primary leveling, so high accuracy leveling, okay, especially say for engineering work or plant work where we're building for construction, it will be S is equal to two root K. Okay, where S is our allowable misclosure in millimeters and K is the distance in kilometers. Okay, so secondary leveling, which is more often than what I used as a surveyor, which would be 7.5 root K. Okay, so let's have a look at this table here. So for primary leveling, so it's very uh, accurate. If I level for a kilometer, I'm allowed two millimeters error. Okay, if I level for a hundred kilometers, I'm allowed 20 millimeters error. Okay, so it's a very, very uh, precise uh, work to actually get these sort of, uh, sort of um, misclosure errors. So that typically, as I mentioned, for say aerial photography and survey work in general, uh, for the, we've got general here, but we're talking about say um, good survey work. Okay, we're on secondary. So if I level for a kilometer, I'm allowed eight millimeters. It's not a lot of error. If I go for a hundred kilometers, I'm allowed seventy-five millimeters. It's still pretty good. It's good accuracy. And then obviously the general leveling is out, out the park a little bit there. Okay. So predominantly we would use primary and secondary in mining. Okay, so primary very much for construction and substance leveling. And the secondary would be for your general day-to-day -day survey work, i.e. photo control, etc. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So in terms of the Mine Health and Safety Act, 1996 chapter 17, 4C. So this is all in the process of being changed anyway, uh, but this one still stands at the moment. We mentioned that mining, sometimes they would give a false uh, elevation. So everything below the bank on the mine would be either positive or negative. Okay, but as of the 12th of November, 2004, okay, uh, elevations determined above and below grounds on mines refer to mean sea level based on the South African land leveling data as determined by the chief director, okay. So as I mentioned here, before this regulation in, was in place, a false datum was assumed, which was not linked to mean sea level. This would ensure that all elevations would have the same sign, i.e. all positive or all negative, so as not to confuse users of maps or plans. Okay. But now, as of the 12th of November 2004, all maps and plans must be related to mean sea level. Okay. So we've mentioned leveling using a level and staves and staves and that and ways of closing and misclosure errors. There is another way of doing heighting, which isn't as accurate uh, unless you do reciprocal trig heighting. Um, but basically we can use our total station to calculate elevation differences. Now, if I'm going up a hill like this and this is quite mountainous, leveling can be quite a difficult task. So trig heighting would be a far easier option in this instance. So I set up my total station, I know my height of instrument, and I know the elevation of the point I'm at at mean sea level. So I add up and I'm coming to this line here. So this red line here, if it was a level, would be the equivalent of the height plane of collimation, okay? So then I sight my prism at my uh, target, which is on another prism, and I know the height of that as well, okay, so I've measured from the ground up to that. I can measure my slope distance and I know my vertical angle. So using a straightforward trig, I can calculate the height difference between the center of the instrument and the prism. So 
my elevation will be the elevation here, add the instrument height, add the height difference between the instrument and the prism, and then subtract the height of the, of the target or the prism height there to get back down to the ground. And that's basically it. What I would like then like to do would then set up my instrument here and sight the prism back down here. And then we have two height differences. And we take the mean of the two. Then we're gonna get a far better uh, elevation between the two points. And that's basically trigger heighting. So I don't have to use a level. I can use a total station, but as I said, it's not always as accurate, but it is uh, a possibility to use, especially if you're in a mountainous area. Okay, but now there's only one thing to remember with trig heighting, that the distance that is measured with the total station has to be corrected. Okay, so we've already done our temperature and pressure. Don't worry about that, we've done that. We have to take into consideration curvature and refraction. Okay, so if you're doing long distances, and you're doing trig heighting, you've got to take into consideration curvature and refraction. So here's basically the um, formula. So C plus R, curvature and refraction, is equal to S squared multiplied by this fancy long number. Okay, and that number at the bottom there is the CNR constant for South Africa. Okay, and where S is our slope distance in meters. So if we go forward, uh, we've got a little bit of calculation there. So my slope distance is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The vertical angle we had uh, with, with height difference, we're calculating that out there and gives us an, uh, a height difference of 113.233. But then when we take into consideration curvature and refraction over that distance, which is over a kilometer, we multiply it by the factor, we get curvature and refraction is, is 0 0.104. Okay, so we always add curvature and refraction and when we add the two together, you can see now the actual height difference is actually 113.337. So you can see that there's that 0.104 difference. So that could affect um, whatever, some survey work, whatever you're doing and to whatever accuracy you're looking at. Okay, so I've done a quick table here of different distances all the way up to two kilometers. So you can see here curvature and refraction over a distance of 50 meters is minimal, it doesn't even come to a millimeter. Even when I get to 100 meters, it's only gonna change my height difference of one millimeter, okay? And we know that trig heighting isn't as accurate as, as leveling. So a millimeter between friends is probably immaterial. Only when I get up to these higher distances uh, are we getting a uh, bigger uh, curvature and refracture uh, adjustments. Okay, so you can see there two kilometers, we're talking 0.27 of a meter. Okay, so it's very important guys, if you're doing trig heighting, take in, must take into consideration curvature and refraction, especially over long distances. Okay, so we've looked at some leveling, we've looked at um, meridian convergence, uh, we've done, looked at other things, let's have a look at coordinate transformations. So for you guys as geologists, very important, especially if you're working, you've got old map, um, geological borehole data or whatever that's in the old Cape Datum system, and now you're wanting to plot it onto WGS plans because that's, the mine is now gonna be developed and you're gonna be using old um, borehole records or whatever, and you need to plot those onto a new plan. Or you as a geologist have gone into an area and you set up your own grid or a local grid, and you now need to put on that onto the national control space system, i.e. the WG system. Okay, so what is a transformation? So it's the operation of changing as by rotation or mapping, one configuration or expression into another in accordance with a mathematical rule. So especially a change of variables or coordinates in which a function of new variables or coordinates is substituted for each original variable or coordinate. Okay, work that one out, okay. All right, and then, Number two, the formula that affects a transformation. Oh, I, I like that one much, a lot easier. Okay, so let's have a look. So we have different types of transformations. We have linear, which is a fine linear conformal helmet, uh, and we have orth orthogonal, and we have non-linear, non sorry, polynomial variables, general or conformal. So what we're gonna have a look at is the linear conformal helmet transformation. And this consists of translation, so it's a shift, 
a rotation and a scale change. So when we combine them all together, we have that helm transformation. So typically, uh, one of my jobs to, when I was still with Anglo was to do a lot of prospecting and mining rights uh, from old to new and new prospecting rights. So this is a typical example. Here's a polygon of an area uh, for, let's call this a, a mining right or prospect or whatever you want to call it, okay? So there's my area. So there's my farm boundaries, okay? And here on the right-hand side, you can see the coordinates of all of these polygon points of the external polygon, okay? You don't need the points inside, okay? And there was the farm diagram that they all came from. Okay, so all the points, we had a coordinate. So we start at one and we end at one. So there's closed polygon. So there's my coordinates. And as I said, the SG diagrams that they came from. So what I need to do now is set up transformation parameters for this particular area. All right. So then what I did, I plotted this uh, into MicroStation. I went into SERPAC and I put maybe the center point of the polygon and I did a search for all the trig beacons in the area. And I then picked the best trig beacons that bounded the polygon as best I possibly could get. And you can see these little corners are sticking outside of that main trigonometrical uh, polygon, but that was good enough. It was fine, it was 100%, no problems. So then what I did is I've got the trig beacons in the LO system, and I did calculated the transformation parameters with the equivalent trig beacons in the WG system. So you'll see here, trig 64, trig 64, all the way down to 385 to 385. Throw that into the SERPAC software, it then gives me my transformation parameters. Okay, so I've got scale, swing, standard deviation, and I've got a mean, mean Y shift and the mean X shift. So there's that scale rotation and, and uh, translation. I then do it the other way from WG to LO21. Same software, just turn the coordinate systems around, and then I can get the coordinate, uh, the transformation parameters from WG to LO. Okay, so you can see they are very similar in the sense that the, that the swing is plus 2.6 from LO to WG and minus 2.6 from WG to LO, makes sense. And then you can see the other numbers are, so the standard deviation is the same, the mean Y and the mean X shift, in this instance is negative. Here, same, exactly the same numbers, but positive, because I'm going between the two different systems, one to the other. Okay, so there's my parameters. I've done that in software. Okay, so on my map or plan, I will have the coordinates that I'm using in the transformation parameters. Okay, so this isn't the one we've just looked at now, but this is for a particular mine. There's its mine benchmark. So it's got its X, Y, and it's got its elevations here. And in those days, we had a, a datum below uh, or depth below datum. Uh, and that's where that false um, elevation would have come in, okay? So this is typically what would go on a mine plan. And there are the transformation parameters for this particular area. Okay, so going back, there's my polygon, there's all my, my uh, farm uh, coordinates and farm diagrams, there's the title, and there's all the benchmark information there, okay? All right, so, Transformation, practical examples, all right, so borehole collars. So like I mentioned, you could have borehole collar information on the old Cape system. Um, you could even have it on an old farm system from way back, and you need to put it onto modern plans or the, the national control survey system, which you are now using to do your design of your mine. And that. So it's very important that we can have co those coordinates and transform them to the system that you want to use. So there's a nice little picture. I'm getting, probably getting new geologists all excited to see all that core shed there. Even for me as a surveyor, I, I just spend hours in a core shed, moving boxes around. No, I didn't. No. <laughs> Would never do that. Okay. All right, so borehole collars. So boreholes, as I mentioned, may have been drilled pre-January 1999. 
uh, on the Cape datum and now to be used in the project operation that is on the Heart of Bistook 94 datum. You can have boreholes may have been drilled on a UTM system and are now required in the LO system. So for example, in Zimbabwe, where they use both systems, or boreholes, as I said, may have been drilled on a local geology grid. Okay, the, the geologists have got in there before anybody else. They've set out lines and they've got a, uh, their own sort of system going. Now you need to transform or transfer that system onto the National Control Survey system. And that's where the surveyor will come in and survey comparative points so that we can put the, in this instance, local geology grid onto the National Control Survey system. So on the right-hand side there, you can see we're using a leveling staff there at a borehole. So we're doing all our leveling. But we would have surveyed this as well. It may have been set out by the geologist, got a coordinate. We're now going to transform it and put it into the, uh, the control system of, this, of the country. So this is a uh, dear friend of mine many, many years ago uh, to the Kabanga project in Tanzania on the Burundi border. Uh, young Anthony Innocent, I'm sure he's a little bit older now like me. Okay, so borehole collars. So borehole positions are required to be plotted on all mine plans to mitigate a hazard risk. Okay, so you bore a, a hole, you do whatever you need to, you cap it, that borehole could actually fill with water or gas or whatever. So that hazard is a possibility of, that hazard, the hazard is the possibility of a borehole that may contain water or other fluid or dangerous material being mined through. So we need to know exactly where those boreholes are and to what depth they go through to. Okay, so this could cause an inrush into the workings of the material contained in the borehole. So if the borehole is a metal casing, then this could also be cause damage to machinery as the borehole is mined through. Okay, so no boreholes are drilled to locate an ore body or seam, but they are also drilled in order to not find an ore body or seam. So this is for sterilization purposes, so that the mines infrastructure, stockpiles and dumps are not located above or on the ore body or seam. Okay, so you guys as geologists, uh, on the right-hand side here, you may have uh, had uh, boreal information in this particular area. So this is a mining area. And what I've done here is I've found my best polygon of trig beacons that goes around the area. Okay. And I've then calculated the uh, transformation parameters for this particular area. So I've used nine trig beacons. You can see over here, I've used nine trigonometrical beacons. Here they all are here in the LO29, and here they are in WG. So I would have put this into SERPAC, like that example I showed earlier. And then I would have fed this into my spreadsheet. There's the parameters that would have been calculated for me. So I just put this in here into a simple spreadsheet. There's the formula. So I'm looking for WG coordinates because obviously this was done pre 1st of January, 1999. I've got a lot of information here, but the geologist needs to know what they, these coordinates are in WG29. So me being a, a kind surveyor that I am, I would put this spreadsheet together for the, for the geologist. So all they need to do then is put the borehole collar name in, the coordinates in Y and X. Uh, the, the Z will not change because when it doesn't, uh, the transformation does not affect Z. But if there was maybe a constant of 50 meters or whatever, you could put that in here and you would get your Z there. But all you need to do then, even if you've got an Excel spreadsheet uh, of those coordinates of the, of the boreholes, you just drop it in here and it gives you the WG coordinates. And this is, I did a lot of this uh, for the geologists at Anglo. So you can see this one here was, was for Anglo Coal Geological Services borehole colors only. Okay, so this is something that I would have put together for the geologists. Okay, so there's just a little bit of a close up of the formula there. There I've used my nine tricks. There's my transformation parameters. And there is basically a simple formula to go from LO to WG. Okay, so accurate borehole collar survey equals an accurate geological model. So accurate borehole collars, as I mentioned, accurate, accurate geo, geological model. So boreholes may have been drilled pre January 1999 and was surveyed using the LOK data. So the boreholes are now used to delineate the ore body and the mine is being designed on the WG RWS 94 datum. So we need to 
change between the two. And there's the parameters there of a typical example. But if I didn't realize that they were in Cape Dayton and someone gave me a list of borehole collars and I assumed, never assumed, but you assumed that they were in WG, I could be plus minus 27 meters out in Y or plus minus 300 meters out in X looking at this, all according whether I'm going LO WG or WG to LO. That's why I put the plus minus there. Okay, so guys, it's very important that if someone gives you coordinate data, you know exactly what system they're in. Don't just assume because it's past the 1st of January 1999 that it's going to be WG. It could be an old set of coordinates. Okay. All right. Now we're looking at the engineering system with transformation parameters. So as geologists, maybe not so uh, involved with this when it comes to all collars, but for engineering systems, what we fabricate in a factory that we bring onto a mine site and we need to fit it over the same um, bolts uh, sticking up from the ground. If 100 meters is what we fabricated, when we bring it to site, those bolts must be 100 meters apart. So there we do not apply a scale factor correction. Okay, so engineering is what you see is what you get basically. Well, what you measure is what you get. So this mitigates any confusion with coordinate systems. Okay, so this also makes it easier for setting out engineering surveys, which require a high order of accuracy when meters count. There is no need to adjust distances for scale factors. Engineering systems may have an origin that suits the site and differs from the National Control Survey system to avoid confusion and negative coordinate values. So I may give my engineering system a false origin. So it may be Y 10,000, X 10,000. And this is primarily used for setting out of engineering projects. Okay, so not always will the grid of your engineering coordinates be east, west, north, south. You may tilt them in relationship to the main axis of infrastructure. Maybe if it's a, a steel mill, then you may have it on the main axis of that steel mill. All right, so the orientation of the grid axis may be adjusted to suit the orientation of the main infrastructure. That is, may not be north, south, or east, west, as I mentioned. The transformation parameters cover a relatively small area, typically the size of a plant engineering project area. And there's just a quick photograph. I was very, very fortunate to go to Minas Rio many years ago in Brazil. And here's the plant uh, busy being uh, constructed. All right, so here's, we've, we've looked at coordinates before in between LO and WG. Here is, we have LO29, so it's the old CAPE system. And here's the engineering. So if you look at beacon one and beacon one here, you'll see that a constant has been taken off, okay? But the coordinates without the constant are the same. When you look at beacon two, beacon three, beacon four, beacon five, beacon six, and compare them, you will see that the coordinates are different. These coordinates in LO29, the distance between, if I were to do joins, would have a scale factor applied. These ones here in the engineering system, will not have a scale factor applied. So if I do a join between beacon one and beacon two, I'd have a join distance. If I go into measure that distance between beacon one and beacon two in the field, it would be the same distance. No scale factor has been applied. So that is basically the difference between an LO and an engineering system. Okay, and there's just another slide there to show you the difference between the two. And you can see the uh, difference in difference uh, Eastings and Northings of your engineering, they're very, very small. Okay, but don't, you don't really need to worry about this too much. And there's uh, basically a printout. Uh, so we've gone from WG31 to uh, THP engineering. So you can see, and in this instance, the coordinates are totally different. So there's no confusion of me picking up a plan or being given a list of coordinates that look like that and thinking, ah, are they WG31 or are they engineering? I know that the engineering are going to look totally different. So there's never any confusion. Okay, and there's typically, if I was to put this, all that information into SERPAC, that would be my transformation parameters between the WG and an engineering system. And you can see here, the swing is 49 minutes, 34 seconds. So you can see, that our grid is not 
coincident with our grid of the uh, national control survey system. Okay, so we have moved it slightly. <clears throat> okay, so going back to our transformation practical examples, we can come across old survey general farm diagrams, which are in a local survey system. Okay, and they're not in the national control survey system. So once, when I was working at Anglo, as I mentioned, I was doing prospecting rights and mining rights, transferring old to new. And in some instances, we would find plans for the SG would send us diagrams, which were from 1896. Okay, so, Trying to read this was, could be quite difficult because they've been copied so many times. But one thing about them, the handwriting was awesome. <laughs> the guys took a, took a lot of pride in their handwriting. They weren't typed. But invariably, they would be in a local system. And typical units of measurement that you would find would either be English feet, Cape feet, Cape roots. And if you were in Namibia, it would be in German legal meters. So what you had to do then was to actually decipher this information and then plot these points and then do the transformation as best you could. And invariably, when you compared what these guys did in 1896 to what we have today with our Toyota Land Cruisers and GPS and all the fancy stuff, and these guys were on horseback and using dials and stuff, the difference in the accuracy was awesome when you compare it to what we've got today. Okay, so here's a typical old SG diagram, very, very old. And if you were to zoom in on this, you probably find it's in Morgan's or something, the area, and it was measured in Cape feet. So the first thing we've got to do is convert that to a metric. Okay, so old survey uh, general farm diagrams in non-metric units, metric SI units. So one Cape foot is equal to that in international, I'm not going to read that out, international meters, one English foot, is a little bit different. So obviously someone in the Cape and someone English has got different foot sizes. Okay, so there's our different uh, uh, factors to convert. Then you've got one SAG, so which is the South African geodetic foot, which is the same as an English foot. And then you had Cape roots as well. Okay, so another factor altogether. So in simple terms, if we want to uh, if we found out many old SG diagrams on the uh, Cape feet, to convert that to meters, we would use the relevant factor. Some old SG diagrams are in Cape roots. So we either multiply by the factor there, which we had on the previous page, or we multiply by the Cape feet and then multiply by 12. Okay, so there's Cape, 100 Cape feet is equal to 31.486 meters. And then 100 Cape roots, we can either multiply straight out by the factor, which gives us 377.827, or we can multiply by the Cape feet factor and then multiply by 12, and gives us that same answer. So invariably what we would do, uh, when I was doing this kind of work, I would have a spreadsheet of all the coordinates and everything, and then I would do my join distances. Because if you go back to the, um, coordinates, there's my coordinates, and then you get the sides and the corners. So you know the subtended angles at each corner, and you would know the distances between the points. So then what I would do is just put it straight into a, a spreadsheet in Cape Roots in this instance, convert it to Cape Feet. There's my conversion factor from Cape Feet to meters. Okay, and that would give me my answer for each of those sides. And it's amazing when I would actually calculate this out and I would compare it. Say, if I had A and B uh, from this farm diagram from 1892, and I had a coincident length on a new, on a farm diagram that has recently been surveyed, I would find that those two distances would be minimal dis difference, which is fantastic when you think of back in 1892. You didn't have a four by four to drive around in. You're probably on horseback. And your instruments were pretty basic in comparison to what we have today. Okay. So there, guys, is pretty much how to convert if you've got information in old uh, 
measurements and you want to convert it to meters. So you've got all that there for your, uh, for your use going forward. <clears throat> okay, so I was given a lot of information for Venetia uh, diamond mine, old borehole color information. And they were, they, the Y and X were actually in Cape feet. And it said above the Y and X, Cape feet. And in the Z or the elevations, it also had Cape feet. Uh, sorry, it, it had English feet, sorry. Then I had another list and it was also Cape feet for Y and X, but in the elevation, it didn't have anything. It didn't say anything there at all. So I didn't know whether it was English feet or Cape feet. So I spoke to my boss at the time. He says, oh, I haven't the faintest idea. Phone Mr. Ulufsa. He's retired. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But phone Mr. Ulufsa in Neisner. I worked with, with Dick for many, many years. Fantastic guy. And this is some of that information that I'm giving you now that you, you will not find in a textbook. And it's, it's word of mouth, basically, from other surveyors that have worked with that. So me not knowing, it didn't have on the top of the elevations whether it was Cape feet or English feet. But when I phoned oh, Dick, he then said to me, all elevations will be in English feet. They are not in Cape feet. So you can have the Y and the X in Cape feet, but the elevation is always in English feet. Okay, so there's a little snippet of information you're gonna walk away with today. If you ever come across, um, say, borehole information from way back when, and they're in Cape feet, you'll know that the elevation is always in English feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So geological exploration, so coordinates in a local geology system because no survey system exists on site. So you as a, a geologist gets there, surveyor's a bit too slack, he's still sitting in the pub somewhere. He hasn't got to site and he hasn't put a, hasn't brought in survey system to the area. So you get on with it, okay. But what, then what happens when he has left the pub, the surveyor then transfers the survey control to the site. And then strategic pegs are then surveyed that have been placed on the local ge geological uh, geology system, okay? So from that, if we've got um, multiple pegs which are in both systems or multiple points that are in both systems, we can then generate transformation parameters. Okay. And then all the local geology coordinates can be transformed to the survey control survey system, okay? So that would be your national control system. And this would may include borehole colors as well. Okay, so this is uh, Naimalima Hill, which is fairly recent photography uh, from Google Earth. But I first went there back in 1996. So this was just uh, covered in trees. There was no mining, nothing was here. It was just the geologists and me. Okay, and what had happened is the geologists had actually put a grid out over Naimalima Hill, because, but there was a, quite a lot of uh, laterite and there were issue, magnetic issues. So there was a slight bit of swing going on. So you think you were going across with the compass in parallel lines, meanwhile, they weren't so parallel. So this was a bit of a nightmare to actually get this onto the National Control Survey System. So we had a local geology group, which, a grid which was set out by compass and tape, and there were swing issues because of the magnetics in this area. And we had some scale issues as well. So we had to convert that then to the UTM coordinate system. And it was evident in our findings, but they're mining there now. So everything must have been 100%, okay. And here, Sariola gold mine, uh, also went there first time in 1996 when there was no mine at all. There was a hill with a baobab on the top. And here you can see all of these uh, cut lines. Um, I didn't do any of these, but I did the Yatella. Uh, which is a mine for the north from Sariola. So we actually went and cut the lines for the geologists. They know exactly, they knew exactly where they wanted to start and we would cut the lines and put the cuts in for the, the geologists so they could actually go and do their um, exploration. Okay, so I mentioned GPS or GNSS earlier, uh, Global Navigation Satellite System. Uh, which covers all the serve, all, all the satellite systems. GPS just refers to the American system. Okay, so it's always better to call it GNSS because then we're including everybody, but the generic term is GPS. All right, so we need to do a transformation to fit our GNSS coordinates to the fixed survey control points that have been surveyed in the National Control Survey System. 
Okay, so this obviously isn't in South Africa, you can see that. Um, this is actually at uh, Peace River Coal in British Columbia. So if you look in the back here, so this will excite geologists. This is a coal mine. And you can see here that the actual coal seam is pointing to the sky. So there's a whole, you're in the foothills of the Rockies, I think here, and this whole area has been tilted. So it's pretty near vertical rather than being horizontal. And um, a bit sidetracked here, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. When you stood on the side here and you're looking down and you're looking at the coal seam, which has just been peeled off, mined away, and you see dinosaur foot dinosaur footprints and you have this little bit of satisfaction knowing that you're the first person to see those since that dinosaur trod across there many millions of years ago so it's quite a nice nice feeling okay all right let's get back to where we were okay all right so we have to fix the gps coordinates onto the national control survey system so this is resulting in coordinate transformation file and is used for that specific area. Okay, so once we've done our transformation, we then use that in this particular area. And we can use that for elevations as well. If we go to known elevations, we can actually bring the, the GPS survey down onto those elevations. And this ensures survey accuracy. Okay, so I've mentioned transformation parameters, taking trig beacons in the area, uh, and that's exactly what you have to do. You mustn't use a generic or a, a, a countrywide Transform transformation parameters, because you're gonna get lots of mistakes, okay? You have to use a local transformation using the, the best fit trig beacons for that particular area, like I showed in that earlier one, I think in Greenside, okay? So the area for the transformation parameters must be localized, i.e. the survey control must encompass the area in question. So the area must not be extensive and do not use a national set transformation parameters as errors will be evident. So if we look at a close up on this one, you can see here um, the difference uh, uh, down uh, just north of Cape Town or whatever, there's 289, there's 296 over towards the east. And if you go north, it's 299, go back to the west again, it's 295. When we look at uh, this difference here, we've got 67, all the way down to 20. So if I were to use transformation parameters for the whole of the country, and I was then using it in a small area here, maybe in Malanga somewhere, then I'm gonna get poor answers. You've got to use the trigonometrical beacons or whatever beacons you're gonna use that are on the National Control Survey System to generate your transformation parameters for that particular area, okay. All right, so there's just something uh, to be careful of, especially when we're talking of latitude and longitude. Okay, so I've taken an, uh, an example of a trig beacon, uh, Kranzberg, and it's on uh, trig sheet DS2427, if you want to go and find it. Okay, so if I've got that Y X coordinate, which I've taken from the government trig listings, there it is there, and I've transformed it using Serpax software. It gives me a latitude and a longitude of the geographical coordinates. If I take that same coordinate in the WG system of the same point, trig 25, I get those coordinates there. You can see that there's that plus 30 odd, odd meters and 300 meter difference. So I'm happy that that's correct. But do not assume that the latitude and longitude is going to be the same because they change as well. And it's quite amazing how many people you speak to and they say, oh, the lats and longs are obviously going to be the same. No, they're not because they're in different coordinate systems. Okay, so just be careful on that one. And if we plot that, you can see that there's trig 25 right on top of the hill here. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, so this is actually uh, in Google Earth. There it is there. And what I've plotted, I've plotted the WG coordinates for this one because Google Earth is in WG. Okay, so if I was to plot the lat longs in the LO system, obviously they would be in a different position. Not too far away, but they would be in a different position. Okay, so when also we're in the Southern Hemisphere and we're using our system in South Africa, then plotting a point in Google Earth, do not forget the negative frontal lag. Because sometimes if you forget the negative, 
you end up plotting a point in the Sahara and you think, oh, crikey, no, I know I'm wrong. Okay, so just be careful to remember that negative. Okay, so trans, uh, transformation, practical examples. This is where this guy is working on one set of coordinates and this guy is set, working on another one. Okay, obviously this is a little bit of a Photoshop, but yes, this can happen if you're using wrong coordinates or wrong coordinate system, or you have uh, incorrect transformation parameters. Okay, so it's already 20 to four. We're supposed to be finished by four. I should get through this uh, in time. Um, so let's have a look at map plan and scale. So going back to one of the stories I've had when I was working at Anglo, the engineers phone up the survey department, oh, your plans are all wrong. Uh, we've designed this pipeline and the water's not going that way, it's coming this way. Um, so we go and check all our mapping, make sure everything's right. It's 100%, there's nothing wrong. That leveling is no problem. Then we ask the question, but what map and plan are you using? Oh, we're using those plans that you, you did at one in a thousand. Yes, but that's not accurate enough for design work, for detail engineering work. You need something more accurate than that. So you've got to be careful that you pick up a plan, you know what the accuracies are of that map or plan. So this is a table that um, I put together when I was still at Angler, and it comes from the American Society for, for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. But you can imagine all their stuff was in feet and inches. So this all had to be converted. We then had to go and check and make sure that everything was working and correct with regards to contour intervals and uh, RMSEs for X, Y, and Z. So this is what we used at Anglo when we, when we came to do pre-feasibility or feasibility studies. Invariably, if it was pre-feasibility, we would still go for one in a thousand because invariably, if we were pre-fees, normally we would go to feasibility and we didn't want to do the mapping twice or, and, and cost more money. So we basically went in at feasibility. So all our plans when we did mapping projects were at one in a thousand, at least. And this gives you your um, XY accuracy at 0.25 of a meter and your Z value at 0.17 of a meter. And that is for a plan that has a one meter contour uh, interval. Okay. And then obviously at one in 500 more accurate. And that's what these guys should have been using, that they were actually using uh, a lesser detailed scale, or lesser accurate scale, I should say. All right, so let's quickly go through the scales. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen these before. One in 250,000, there's just one of Rustenburg. Shows you the highways, shows you built up areas, shows you areas uh, of parks or uh, trails, and, uh, areas of natural beauty or whatever. Pretty, pretty basic, there's a mine, pick and shovel quite easy to spot, but that's about the detail you're gonna get. Then we get to one in 50,000, so the same sort of area, in Rustenburg. Here we can actually get a little bit more detail. We can actually see the straight streets within that built up area. Uh, we can see uh, hospitals, golf courses, uh, a bit more detail. So then we come to a one in a thousand. So this is typically the scale that we would have used uh, for mapping at Anglo. And here you can see the rail routes, uh, you can see individual buildings. Uh, you've got contours on here at one meter intervals. You've got a lot of detail, a lot more detail in here. Then as we go to one in 500, so there's typically a, a plan of a building. You've even got the dimensions of buildings as well here. Okay, so this is, we're sitting at one in 500. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion sometimes between accuracy and precision. Some people think it's the same thing. They are different. So our first diagram here is we're accurate. We're close to where we should be, but we're not precise. So any, anybody out there that's uh, into shooting, going hunting, you will understand this. So we're accurate, but our grouping isn't very good. In this one here, we're precise. We've got two areas here, but they're pretty well stuck together, but we're not accurate. We're nowhere near where we need to be. And then we're accurate and precise. We're on target and we're grouped nicely. So if you're if you are hunting or if you're into uh, archery, this is what you're looking for. So accuracy of a measurement is defined as the nearest of that value to its true value, a quantity we can never really know because there are lots of uh, issues when it comes to uh, measuring. Okay, so here we 
put it into four diagrams now. We've got low accuracy, we're all over the shot, uh, shop, and low precision. So yes, at least we're hitting the target, but that's about all we can say. We've got low accuracy here. We're a long way from where we need to be, but we're all grouping nicely. So we've got high precision. We just need to move that across to the center. Here we have high accuracy. So we're very close, but cheapest. There's no grouping there at all. And then in this one, high accuracy, high precision. So that's 100%, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so measurements can never be exact uh, due to weight changing weather uh, conditions. You remember we mentioned temperature and pressure. Yes, we do change that. We measure it all the time, but invariably we can never ever get rid of that uh, 100%. So instrument errors, there's obviously issues there and human imperfections. Obviously I'm a surveyor, we don't have imperfections. Okay, we just make mistakes. All right, okay. So every technique of measurement is subject to unavoidable error. Okay, so the surveyor must be concerned with the effect of errors and be aware of all sources and types of error and how they combine. So surveyors must ensure that the techniques they choose will produce results that are sufficiently accurate. So if I wanna do high accuracy, I don't go out with a tractor and a piece of string. I've got to use the correct piece of equipment. So they must know how accurate they need to be and how to achieve this accuracy and how to check that the required accuracy has been achieved. Okay, so in surveying, uh, to produce a plan, the accuracy required is defined by the scale of the plot. Okay, so we had that diagram or that table from the uh, American Society, uh, which we had converted to metric. Okay, so that's what we will be looking at there because there should be no plottable error in the survey data, okay. So a good draft person, okay, we're going back in time here because we don't see those very often. Sorry, can I just take a swig of water? Okay, so a good draft person can plot a length to within 0.25 of a millimeter. So if you've got one of those very fine uh, watering pencils uh, and you've got the, the lead is 0.25 thickness, that's what you can basically plot to, okay. And so if a plan of an area is required at a scale of one in a thousand, that is one millimeter on the plan represents one meter, meter on the ground, one, one to 1,000, the smallest plottable distance is 0.25 of a meter. Okay, so thus for a survey at one in a thousand scale, all the measurements must be taken such that the relative position of any point with respect to any other must be determined by 0.25 meters or better. Okay, so that's the worst case. All right. So engineering tolerances or legal standards might also determine the specifications for other purposes, such as engineering works, property boundary definition, or slopes of energy monitoring, where we are looking for millimeters, especially in a and uh, hard rock mines, say uh, uh, where it's brittle rock movement, we want to pick up to the millimeter. Okay. So we've got a Mine Health and Safety Act, Chapter 17. As I said, this is, is in the process of being uh, rewritten, uh, but at the moment, this is what we're looking at. So our minimum of standard of accuracy for fixing survey stations, there's our formula. So A is 0.015. So to start with, I'm giving you 15 millimeters to play with already. And this is a, a class A survey. And then it's plus S divided by 13,000, where S is the distance in meters between the known and unknown survey station. So as surveyors, when we do our check surveys, we use that formula. And this is for a class A survey. So this is like the top, top range, okay. But the allowable error for a primary survey class A is not greater than A meters. Okay, so that's what we're saying. We mustn't go greater than A meters. So a primary survey means any survey carried out for the purpose of fixing shaft positions, shaft stations, underground connections, upgrading of, of secondary surveys, to primary surveys, and establishing primary survey control. But if I was to play with that 15 millimeters, we could have a failure in a, in a pit. So this accuracy is not suitable for slope stability monitoring, for instance. So legislated survey accuracy is significantly less accurate than that required for engineering survey. A blunt but simple limit of error is slated, or stated sorry, at two millimeters for the control network and three millimeters for all other construction surveys. And this is a paper put together by uh, Colin Bennett and Mike Lewis and Blevins uh, back in 2015. So we can see that our mine health and safety, our legal requirements doesn't satisfy surveys where we need to pick up millimeters. 
as for instance, like I mentioned, slope stability monitoring. Okay, so mistakes in surveying. Um, we all make mistakes and surveyors do as well, not that they will ever admit to it. Okay, so blunders. That's that miscounting or transposing of numbers or even setting up on, on or orientating to the wrong beacon or peg. So we set up on A, we cite to B, and in fact, we're not citing B, we're citing C. But it is easily de detected by checking because when we orientate to another peg, we will actually see that we're either in the wrong place, we're set up on the wrong place, or we're orientating to the wrong beacon. Okay. What about transposing the numbers? Very simple. 126, 56, 48 is written down as 162, 56, 48. When you do your join or your polar and you, and you plot it, you think, why on earth is it plotting there? There must be something wrong. And that is an easy thing to pick up because it will plot wrong. And that's why you take multiple readings so that that 126, you might write it as 162 now. But the next time you will write it as 126, you will take another reading. You'll take another reading. You'll take another reading. And you might have five 126s and 162. You know that the 162 is a blunder. Okay, then you have your systematic errors. And these arrive from sources that act in a similar manner to an observation, such as the method of measurement, the instruments used, and the physical conditions of the instrument of the time of, uh, at the time of measurement, sorry. So if all individual measurements contain the same type of systematic error, which by their nature is always act in the same direction, then the total effect is the sum of all of them. Okay, so every time I set up, if that same error is there, it will actually get larger and larger and larger every time I, I set that instrument up. And the only way to check adequately for systematic errors is to either remeasure the quantity by an entirely different method using different instruments. Okay. So typically in a total station and a systematic error could be the incorrect PPM. I haven't set the ambient temperature and atmospheric pressure during the day. Or I'm using a very a mini prism and I've got my instrument set for a big prism with a zero constant, whereas the prism constant for a small one is 17.5 millimeters. So if I don't change it, um, that error is gonna be there the whole time. Uh, for GPS systems, incorrect survey system, I've set it wrong in the, in the GPS itself, we're using geoidal heights rather than orthometric heights. For the level, collimation error. Remember the two peg test hasn't been done. And we're using that leveling staves with two different zeros. So one is a zero and the other one's been chopped off a bit. Maybe a, a centimeter is missing. It's been worn down. If we don't pick that up and we carry on our, our leveling, then we're gonna have a problem. We're gonna have poor leveling results. And then we have our random errors and those are discrepancies remaining once the blunders and systematic errors have been made. So even if a quantity is measured many times with the same instrument, in the same way, and, all, and if all sources of systematic error have been removed, it is still highly unlikely that all results will be identical. So you can imagine if I'm measuring a distance with a total station for half an hour, and I don't change the temperature and pressure, and we have a slight increase or decrease in, in, in temperature or pressure, then those distances will be, um, will be different, but very slightly. The difference is caused but mainly by limitations of instruments and observers are called random errors. So they are accidental in nature. And the positive and negative errors are equally likely to occur. So for instance, if I'm reading a leveling staff, I might read a millimeter above the line, and next time I'll read a millimeter below the line. So basically the one equals out the other, okay? And they tend to follow a distribution. So most errors in survey and propagate, meaning that the error grows over the number of setups. Observing procedures are designed so that most mistakes that occur are discovered immediately and possible sources of systematic errors are eliminated. So I always tell my students, how do you spell survey? C-H-E-C-K. Always checking, that's what surveying is all about. So additional or redundant observations are taken so that all data can be checked for the mistakes, the blunders, systematic errors, and random errors that do occur. Observations and measurements are repeated several times, and the observation of redundant data serve both as checks and to improve on the precision of the final result. So what happens, we're getting towards the end now, so we can have a bit of lightheartedness, when it all goes wrong. So obviously I think these are extreme situations, but you can imagine setting that out on a road, 
and just, yeah, not thinking about it, just doing it. You can see here, great for skateboarding, but not so much for parking your car in the garage. So extremely steep. Here, when they designed this, the elevation, elevations were incorrect uh, for the footings and the footings didn't, weren't extended far enough. So oh, there is a cheap and cheerful way of getting around it. Just pile rocks up underneath the, your steelwork. That's gonna be a tough ride home on the train. And that's chicken and the egg story, isn't it? Uh, which came first, the footpath or the opening? Okay, it happens, I'm sure. And then being a surveyor myself, there's three other surveyors and just one other guy, just a, a somebody. I'm sure you recognize this Mount Rushmore in the States. So you'll see there that Washington was a surveyor, Jefferson was a surveyor, Roosevelt was, well, we don't know what he was, probably a lawyer, and Lincoln, a surveyor as well. So I am in good company. Not that I want to be president of the USA. Okay, and then another famous surveyor uh, from Wales, uh, born back in 1790, Colonel Sir George Everest, or Everest, as they say in Wales. And he was the Surveyor General of India from 1830 to 1843. And word has it that he probably never ever saw the mountain that was named after him. Okay, so here's the test for today, guys. You can take this away with you, or we can solve it right now. Okay, so this is a quick one for you. What is the sum of all the numbers from one to 100? So that's one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way up to 100. Okay, so I'll put you out of your misery. This is getting close to four o'clock. Okay. So basically what you do is you take one plus 100, which is 101, two plus 99 is 101, three plus 98, and so it goes on. So you will have 50 101s. So if you multiply that out, it's 5,050. Okay, so that was a question asked to a certain person, which you can see below you here. And the story is, or whether it's an old wives tale or true or not, he was supposedly seven at the time. So when he was a little seven-year-old boy in class, he was asked that question and he came up with the answer straight away. So that was Carl Friedrich Gauss. And we mentioned earlier in the lecture, remember that name Gauss, because uh, he's got a lot to answer for. Uh, born in Germany in uh, 1777, born in eight, uh, died in 1855. And he is, we can thank him for uh, algebra, geodesy, statistics, optics, geophysics, astronomy, matrix theory, etc. Cetera, et cetera. All those things that give you nightmares, it's him. Okay. And we've talked about total stations a lot today. This is also a total station. Okay. So when I mention total stations, just think that this isn't the one I was talking about. Okay. So just to recap, guys, thanks for listening in. Uh, projections for South Africa, zero is south. We have positive and negative Y coordinates in South Africa. We have different survey systems. You could be in the wrong field. Um, I have, when I was working for Anglo, I was had up for trespass, but it wasn't uh, because of coordinate systems. I just went to the wrong side of a river to put a point in and I was seen in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they saw me, but anyway, that's another story. Um, so we have different survey systems. We have our Cape system. Uh, Cape Datum, and we have the uh, Hardebeestook 94 system. And we also have our old farm diagrams as well in different surveys, farm systems. Transformations in the pitfalls, as I mentioned, got to make sure that we have the correct transformations for the area that we're looking at. Map scale, just don't pick up a map and think that the accuracy is there. A map scale has certain accuracies or should have certain accuracies if they're done correctly. We have accuracy and precision, which we went through, and we have the errors that could possibly uh, manifest themselves if we're using the wrong equipment or we do not maintain our equipment properly. We don't have it serviced and calibrated. And that's it, guys. It's just a couple of minutes before four o'clock. I think I did, uh, timing's quite good there. Are there any questions? I will go to chat now quickly. Um, 
thanks so much for that. Uh, so many things to remember. <laughs> but you've, you're, you've got it recorded, so you're more than welcome to keep going. Uh, yes. And it's also good to hear that it's not just geologists that get done for trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I got something in the post saying I was... <laughs> He was the, one of the Anglo directors I was working on his farm, so he sorted it out. I, I wasn't in trouble. All right. <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions. Before we get, get onto the questions, I just want to check, Ulrika, are you happy with um, that you have been answered? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, if you can just confirm that for me. Um, okay. Do you want to just go through the question, question again? Yeah, I know you. Hi, it's Ulrika. Hi there. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> um, no, I just remember quite a few years ago at Anglo, we did use two conversion files for our boreholes. But I think I've got the answer now is that the one was for the Cape feet, for the coordinates, and then the downhole depths, we used the English feet conversion. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that not a lot of people know about. I, I didn't know about it until I asked someone who had retired many years before. And he was like one of those guys you could ask him about anything. And he, and he would even, even read out the conversion factors without looking them up. Because he in his day, he probably used them day in, day out. And they were like etched into his, into his brain. So, And it's those little things, yeah. What are, what are elevations? They are always in English feet. Yes. Never you know, that's... That makes sense. Thanks very much. Um, Cesar Matten, sorry, I forget your name. I should know it by now. Would you like to ask your question? Certainly, thank you. It's Carrie. Um, thank you very much for a, a, a delightful talk, Hugh. Uh, there was a lot more maths than what I was expecting, but uh, <laughs> managed okay. Um, I want to ask you on the on this topic of tolerance and error. So you've mentioned the idea of uh, legislated uh, tolerance, which I understand perfectly. The group will get together, they'll decide uh, what the, the minimum and maximum values are. They'll um, gazette it, it'll be in place. But during your talk, it was around about slide number 60, you uh, gave a table of misclosure errors and the tolerance yes. to that. Um, what, is that, uh, how do you say, a fixed rule in the field of surveying, or is that a generally accepted practice, but not so much enforced by the group? Um, yeah, I think that was the elevation ones, wasn't it? With, with the two root K, seven root K, 7.5 root correct, K. Yes. Yeah, that was for yep. elevation and disclosure. So there's, there's, there's nothing, re you know, like if you look at chapter 17, it just gives you a class A survey. Um, but it doesn't really go heavily into elevation. And that's why we've, we actually, I read many books. I, I looked at about six or seven uh, textbooks from around the world um, and looked at which was the most uh, adequate for us at Anglo-American at the time. And I, I gleaned from that, from those books, the best that I could find. Um, and that's where I, I came up with the two root K and the 7.5 root K. That seemed to be the, the, the overriding message from, from the books that I found. Some were way off, you know, the, the error was just, was just too big. It wasn't, it wasn't important to us, you know, it was, it was, it was useless. Uh, so we, we erred on, this, on the more, uh, what would you say, the conservative side of things to make sure that our mapping was accurate. Um, so, if you look at the uh, the scales, you know the one in five hundred, one in a thousand, and you look at the, the error for Zs, um, we then looked at that, and then looked at what our misclosure errors should be for a typical aerial survey, of one in a thousand. What are we allowed, and what should we be we be getting? Okay, so we 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 sort of married the two together, um, but. From a, a legislation point of view, we go above and beyond that. I understand. Thank you very much, Hugh. Okay, pleasure. And there is, there's a question from Kelly about whether we can get the presentation or not. Um, we are. We have recorded it, and we will put the recording onto the YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. So a small fee, it's fine. No, it's all right. No, no. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just happy to share this because um, I'm very grey. I've got no hair on top, and it's my it's my turn to hand back stuff. I've learned from other people. It's my turn now to hand that back over to people going forward. Um, and it's, it's not that I don't want phone calls when I'm retiring or, or retired. Um, I always that would be great. But um, yeah, I think it's always good to share knowledge. And I've always said is you know you have different mining companies, um, and they and sometimes they don't want to share knowledge. Um, and I think especially in survey because it's very. Uh, safety related, especially underground mine plans. You've got to know where you are. You've got to know where your old workings are. And if good survey work saves one person's life, then that's everything of importance, especially in mining. And if that means me sharing with somebody else, even if it's a different mining company, if I was with Anglo and I shared it with someone in Goldfields or Subania or BHP or whatever, if I was saving a life on somebody else's mine, damn, that's a good thing to do. Absolutely. Um, do we have any other questions? Well, I think your timing is absolutely yeah. impeccable with three minutes yeah. over, which okay, uh, no problem. But thanks very much for that. Uh, guys, the, you've got sorry. My email. sorry, you've got my email. If anybody wants to drop me a line or wants to clarify something or wants some information, or wants to come and have a beer and talk about the time we had to leave Eritrea because a war broke out, then, you, then please get hold of me. Okay. Okay, I'm putting my hands up for that beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions or comments before we close today's meeting? No? Great, well, I'd just like to say thank you so much um, for doing this. We understand how much time and effort it goes into preparing these things and um, we are so grateful. So thank you very, very much. Um, my and I will now close the meeting. So everybody have a fantastic afternoon and we'll um, chat to you again soon. Thanks, Erling. Thanks, Hugh. Thanks, Amy. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.